Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about where will the news cycle go now, um, now that Kamala Harris is the likely candidate. How will Biden's announcement and her emergence affect it? Okay, our guest for the show is Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thank you, Jay. You know, it's a very complicated thing because I don't think that we think enough about the media. I think the media has a huge effect on things, and it's very mm, subtle sometimes. And then, you know, our way of consuming news, appreciating news, being prepared for news, that also has an effect. And I think that had an effect during the Trump administration, during the Biden administration, especially now. Uh, so Tim Snyder wrote an article uh, recently, and uh, he talked about balanced reporting, raising a lot of issues about the media. Do you want to discuss that article? Snyder is a terrific historian, and he is addressing the American public uh, at a critical time in our history because he recognizes that we're flirting with authoritarianism. And that's his background as a scholar is what happened in Ukraine and Europe during and before World War II. So I have a great deal of respect for Timothy Snyder. In this particular article, which he writes on substance in order to reach a, a, a more general and wider audience, is talking about what we normally call the both sides approach of journalism. It uh, has been taken as a principle of journalism and taught to young would-be journalists that in order to present an issue, you have to present both sides of the issue. First of all, he takes, um, he, he takes issue with the idea that there are only two sides to an issue. Uh, that creates kind of an either-or, zero-sum game perspective that historians feel very uncomfortable dealing with because the closer you get to something that really happens in life, a phenomenon, the more you see shades of gray and you see that it's subtle. There are reasons for things, even things that turn out to be bad, there, there are reasons why people embrace that. But he says, not only does it create kind of a, a team approach to things where you have polarization, which can be a very bad thing, as we have found out, um, this kind of dualistic perspective, because um, it creates kind of a, a desire to fight. And conflict uh, in a democratic society should be reconciled through rule of law. But in this case, rule of law has had its nose thumbed at, so to speak. But then he makes an analogy, saying that there's kind of a religious thing going on here. It isn't just politics or social issues. It's like a cult has taken over um, the GOP. And we've heard this analogy before. I, I take issue with that because I'm a scholar of religious studies. We have our principles too. And one of them is that almost everything that has to do with life and death or meaning questions really does bring in a sense of emotion and religiosity that is not necessarily recognized as religion. Um, however, the word cult has a particular meaning that was distorted by um, a group of people with no particular background in anything. Um, they just decided they would take an either or perspective toward groups that got into trouble like the Branch Davidians and characterize them as um, evil and cultish. What we mean by cult in religious studies is a worship of a particular deity, like the cult of Mary within Catholicism, which is not necessarily a bad thing. So I take issue with this notion that the MAGA movement is cultish and that the uh, media has some kind of responsibility to um, to reveal to the public uh, that you can't deal with this as on the one hand or the other hand, both sides. And he calls up the time that Trump talked about the people that were the Ku Klux Klan and uh, white nationalists that were parading in Charlottesville, saying there were good people on both sides of that, he presumed. 
which is a good thing to take issue with because if somebody's parading around and is uh, demonstrating anti-Semitism and, and violence results, which did, um, that's not a good idea to present both sides. You have to take a moral stand, I think is what he's trying to say. And I agree with that. The more you get into periods like ours in history or before the Civil War to which it hasn't been compared, where you have a slavery and anti-slavery dual dynamic, um, there is perhaps uh, not a both sides approach that journalism should take. It should state the moral uh, stance of both sides, not just both sides, but and, 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 and regard them as a formula, an equation, if you will, but rather one side is for human rights and one side is not for human rights, let's say. So let's spell that out instead of dealing with the superficialities. Well, you know, the people parading and saying Jews shall not replace us. On the one hand, they there's some very fine people there. And on the other hand, those that are protesting, well, there are some stinkers there, too. That article was interesting for me in the sense that uh, it identified the both sides ism phenomenon. And that evoked all kinds of other issues and concerns. You know, here's here's some thoughts that I had. Um, reading that article. One is, it, it, you know, whether the founders realized it at the beginning or not, there's a nexus between the media and democracy. You have to have a certain quality of media if you're going to continue to have democracy. I mean, for one thing, you expect it to tell the truth. I don't think the founders could see, you know, modern technology coming. I don't think they could see the problems in the media um, you know, in the 19th century, we had newspapers, and that telescoped uh, the views that were expressed by politicians. Um, Abe Lincoln had the benefit, and, and uh, uh, Douglas, Stephen Douglas, had the benefit uh, in their you know, various encounters um, of, of the newspapers. In fact, the speeches were printed verbatim in the newspapers. So, you know, there was a certain emergence of media in that period of time. But now we have media that's really high tech and that has created new issues, new problems. Uh, and especially if they are driven by capitalism, um, driven by uh, advertisers, uh, driven by um, ideology from the top, um, this does create a bit of a problem in, in a democracy, especially a democracy where people do not learn the fundamentals in school uh, where they are essentially ignorant of, of the structure of our government, and they are vulnerable to uh, lies and comments that would undermine the structure of our government. So if you look at what happened uh, during the Trump administration, lying became the flavor of the week, um, alternative uh, facts. And, and, you know, people bought that. Whether you call it cult or anything else, they bought it a lot of... Uh, listeners and viewers over that period of time on, on um, Fox News and on Sinclair Radio were just taking, taking it all and listening to it and not actually testing it. Uh, they, were, they weren't sitting around, uh, you know, the campfire exchanging views. It was a, it was a, it was a statement uh, to them individually, and they, and they were in such a position that they bought it. And so you had millions of people following Trump around. And thanks to the media, that was happening. They can say that it was fertile ground because the country was heading there anyway, but he, he uh, accelerated it for sure. And then during Biden, you know, the, the media was um, really uh, slow on giving Biden credit for various things and giving Biden credit for trying to fix the, the things that were broken during the Trump administration. And so, you know, by the end of the, the Biden run, which ended last week, um, you know, he had been really damaged by the media. Uh, they were focusing on all the negative points more than the positive points. We, you know, he struggled to make people aware of the good things that he had done, but he really didn't convince them. And part of that, maybe a substantial part, is that the media didn't, didn't spend the time on that. They liked the raw meat stories. If you have media that's lying, if you have media that's um, prioritizing, perhaps in the wrong way, um, because of capital concentrations, um, then, you know, you have media that 
uh, turns black to white and white to black. And you talk about, um, you know, the, the gray, um, the complex, um, it turns into black and white. And, and we have had that. Well, Trump wanted it, but the media has accelerated uh, and exacerbated this divisiveness. And you also have media that has gone in so many directions, Gene. You have TV, you have uh, regular you know, network TV and cable TV. Um, you have all the you know, YouTube type, we like that best. The YouTube TV, which is really on cable these days. You have newspapers and really there's main, two main newspapers in the country and the Times is at the top of the heat. Maybe the, um, the Washington Post ain't where it was. Um, and you have social media that competes against all of them. Um, and now you have a new social media like Discord, which is a, a great big, um, a great big uh, uh, a place where you can join and make your statements and, um, and hear what other people have to say. Discord actually has a value in that regard. So in our daily lives, we've changed, COVID changed us, and we're changed now, you know, in terms of consuming media. We, we have, some of us have fewer media, some of us have more media, but in any event, we don't have that much time to deal with the media, to digest the media, to discuss the media with others. And finally, as I mentioned, colleges don't really give you a baseline. Don't give these kids, these students, a baseline, a fundamental understanding of the way the system works, of the reality in the world. Um, and, and are they, you know, people say, oh, they're young and we're happy that we have young people voting. But are young people really qualified to vote if they don't understand what's going on, if they can't answer the, the Jay Leno questions, um, the jaywalking questions, if you recall? So I think what we have is confusion. And there are those who would, you know, take advantage of that confusion, like Trump. Uh, and the people who support him. Uh, and of course, you have influences from overseas, like Putin, trying to change American public opinion, and in fact, run the government here through that. Um, and so it's really, it's really complex now, and it is unpredictable, and it is scary. That's my reaction. You're correct in presenting a view of a very multiplex and complex and overwhelming um, media phenomenon. Um, we used to have a few outlets and a few um, anchors that uh, people primarily would listen to. You think of Edward R. Murrow during World War II or Eric Severide or Douglas Brinkley, um, these were prominent voices and NBC, ABC and the channels were few. Now we have like um, the multiplicity of outlets and even more so since 2016, it was remarkable to watch the change in Fox News, which started out as a respectable conservative voice in the media, because you have to have what's called a POV, a point of view. When you write an article, you have a thesis. Every college kid and even high school kid learns that. When you write a paper, you have a thesis, you have an argument, and you marshal your, um, your evidence to support that thesis. And that's what every newspaper article uh, that's on the opinion page attempts to do. The regular news articles are supposed to be information-based. You're supposed to answer uh, what, where, why, and when in the first paragraph, so that if people don't have time to read more than the first paragraph, at least they get the facts, ma'am. Now, it's different today. I can speak, I have kids and I have grandkids, and uh, they don't read uh, the newspaper. I take the... the the local newspaper, which we should all do to support the local news because they're going out of business and we all need to know what's going on in our own communities. But they use social media, they use Facebook, they use podcasts, they're very, very popular. Then they find particular individuals 
not just one individual like Edward R. Murrow, that they want to follow. So they uh, program their devices uh, to listen to these particular individuals. Then you have the late night performances of Jon Stewart and the comedians, which aren't really comedians, they're performance artists. And we have this remarkable interface, this Venn diagram now, <laughs> using a new term for most people, uh, where the uh, idea of performance and entertainment overlaps um, the news outlets. Um, you're right about democracy and you're right about its relationship to the information estate. Um, the, the motto of the Washington Post is democracy dies in darkness. Mm -hmm. They have a dedication. They have a point of view. And that point of view is support democracy. And in the name of that, they try to do their very best in both analyzing and presenting the facts. Now, I just have here a, a few little articles that I took off the uh, online news media recently from uh, three different uh, outlets. And it reassures me, and I hope it reassures you, that in the treatment of one very important current story, they seem to be, um, be acting responsibly. Let me just give you an idea. The news outlet Politico is an online news outlet on politics. And it really has an excellent stable of reporters who come off uh, some of the main news outlets behind it. This is coverage of the Republican convention. The Republican convention was itself a performance, as all such conventions are. They are presenting point of view propaganda from the political party's um, campaign program. And uh, you have all of us who watch it know we have we're, we're being convinced that you know this is the be all and the end all and the answer to everything. But here's how you have to cover this with a little bit of skepticism. And first of all, it, there's one here from The Atlantic, which is a very reliable organ of information, The Atlantic magazine, a carnival of disinformation, because now the responsible media is doing immediate fact checks, and they found too many facts were being presented, uh, too much disinformation was being presented regarding the facts. So, uh, and then you have another one where it says the remarkable GOP convention, starting out how certain unprecedented things, that, which is news. And then you have from the New York Times an opinion piece, a guest essay, one of the truly awful and self-indulgent performances of our time. So they're rating it as a performance, the best and the worst moments from night four of the convention. And then you have looking at the selection of his vice president, which is a big news story, an analysis. What's behind this guy? Where does he get his ideas from? What does he really believe? Because in the speeches at the convention, you can't discern what, you, what any politician really believes. It says the seven thinkers and groups that have shaped J.D. Vance's unusual worldview. That could be a term paper. So I'm not as discouraged by the media, as maybe some people are today, provided that you can pick out which sources, which media you can really rely upon. Not too long ago, I stumbled into um, a, a podcast, if you will, and I, I do consume podcasts, uh, although I like to check up on them before I actually watch them, um, by David Brooks of the New York Times and PBS. And the point he made about his life, he's written a couple of books, and of course, since he's a journalist, he talks about journalism. The point he made was that when you are a columnist or a journalist in general, you are walking around all day trying to think of the next news story. And it's a struggle because sometimes you can't think of anything. And I know that happens with uh, politicians who are seeking an issue that they can um, cultivate among their following. Um, and it certainly happens with columnists, as David Brooks, you know, described in detail. 
the problem, the challenge of trying to find a story. You can't keep on repeating the same story. You got to move on, you got to move forward. And that's not only the case for columnists, it's the case for news editors as well. You got to have new news. So that, that opens the question, as I mentioned earlier, of priorities. What are you going to cover? What are you going to leave behind? What are you going to leave on the cutting room floor? It's priorities and it's the dynamic of finding news in a world where you have to fill the time. You know, Seinfeld was famous for saying, and it's amazing, is it not, that there's just enough news to fill the newspaper. To put it the other way around, it's amazing, is it not, that the newspaper is big enough, just big enough to hold the news. Well, there's a lot of other news and there's a dynamic involved. And Trump understands that because he plays that. He, he played that on The Apprentice and he played that in manipulating the press while he was um, you know, doing his real estate practice. Um, he was always trying to get the press to follow his line. And he tried to do that in The Apprentice and he certainly tried to do that and successfully so. Um, you know, in, the, in his uh, administration. So um, what I'm saying is that the press has a challenge. Even good press has a challenge. And the challenge is what are you going to cover next? And what are you not going to cover next? What are you going to leave behind? It's the story of the news cycle, which is the title of our show, The News Cycle. So on, you know, Sunday, Joe Biden drops out. And then the, the, the press is all excited about that and what's going to happen. And so, the, the, you know, the, 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 the light of fame and fortune shine down upon, um, upon on, on, uh, Kamala Harris. And so for the next few days, it's all about Kamala Harris and she raises all this money and she has people coming from all sides and she's, she's the heroine. But at the fringe of it, you see the dynamic is happening. What about this challenge? What about that challenge? Um, can she withstand, you know, the attacks by Trump and Vance? Does she have weaknesses? Let's talk about the weaknesses. And I believe, I don't know how you feel about this, Gene, but I believe it won't be long before the story of Kamala's success in raising money and raising support gets old. Uh, you can't just keep on harping on that. And, and, the, and the media is going to find attack points. You know that Fox News will. You know that Sinclair Radio will. They'll be calling her name. They already are calling her names. Um, but, but all the press will be looking for new stuff. And the fickle finger of the news cycle will turn against her. And I don't know how she's going to handle that. Because the fact is that right now, she's the one representing democracy. Trump does not. Vance does not. And so I don't know what's going to happen here. And I'm a little worried that the, the natural progression of the news cycle could hurt her, will hurt her. What do you think? I think you bring up a fair point about um, choice and priorities and where's the next story coming from and how long they ride it. Uh, I do believe that if you look at it from this angle, news is very unbalanced particularly today. Not that it always hasn't been unbalanced. You remember the yellow journalism of the Hearst newspapers and drum up for World War I and so forth and all of that and the jingoism. It's always been there. However, when we talk about balancing what stories you're going to cover, there has been an increasing drumbeat in newspapers toward finding the exciting, dramatic, uh, human interest, emotional side of things. So that when you read about somebody new, let's say Kamala Harris or J.D. Vance, you're not really talking about the important things about them. You're talking about how they present themselves to others, what names people call them. Too much of the mainstream news today is what so-and-so says about somebody else and how somebody else responds. This is more like a gossip column than it is like a news column. We need to know what's going on in the world. And we also need to know what's going on in the world beyond our own borders. And we need to know what's going on not only with celebrities, 
that Beyonce is branding Kamala Harris based on her multi-million dollar album that's coming out. So business crap cre creeps into this. Um, we find that Rupert Murdoch owns a media empire. He is basically an oligarch, a Western oligarch. He's British, he's not American. And um, this is becoming more and more the case. So we have performance coming into media. The problem with that is that you may not have, quote, alternative facts and lies in the media, although a certain part of the media may have that. But let's look at the more responsible organs of the media. But you will have uh, a point of view that uh, they don't readily give up. And you will have a superficiality uh, and a presentation of things that's more like a movie or a TV series or a performance. It's more like John Stewart. John Stewart is even sometimes more like the news, uh, like real news. So you have this blending. And when a leader like Trump comes along, who comes out of the entertainment his industry himself, and is a, a charismatic leader to whom performance uh, gains, gains recruits, he can utilize this medium, and the medium loves him. So I was very fond of saying that in 2016, when he first ran, he must have gotten millions and millions of dollars of free publicity in his first campaign because he was not known. The advantage of Kamala Harris is that she is not known. So you're right. She's going to get a lot of positive coverage. But one stumble, and it's going to be blown out of proportion, because they will yes. just up this character like a balloon, and then just a little pinprick will burst the balloon. And people worry about that. But I would suggest that everyone pick a responsible news outlet that represents their point of view, one that represents their analysis. And this can be on TV, or it can be on your device, or it can be a podcast, or it can be print news. And you pick out an, uh, a, a, uh, an op opposition point of view. I subscribe to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. I read The Atlantic, and uh, I listen to podcasts by conservative media. You have to kind of open yourself up to get the give and the tank, take, because you can't rely anymore on finding that on the front pages of whatever you read or every podcast you listen to. They're not going to be presenting the other side's point of view and then marshalling their arguments against it. They're going to be characterizing the other side, setting up what we call a straw man, and then using their arguments to tear it down. You know, the problem in these United States is that most people, including most voters, you know, they, they have a middle class or maybe a below middle class life and they work two jobs and they have kids and they can't afford their mortgage if they have a house at all. Um, and, uh, you know, they have, when they come home, they, they have to spend time with their family. They are not independent scholars like you or a guy like me who has the time and inclination, who is motivated to, you know, put, put his or her arms around as much good media as possible. So they're going to have to make choices. Um, they are making choices. Uh, that look for entertainment news. Uh, what is the word for it? Uh, edutainment. Um, and and uh, the problem with that is it's uh, very often inaccurate or it's outright lies. Uh, but I think your point about uh, the raw meat stories is really important. The gossip stuff. You know, for example, so uh, we're, we're into this um, new campaign by what, three days. And um, that's that's only three days, but the news cycle, which used to be two weeks, is now less than two weeks. It may be one week. It may be four days. And, and, and the news editors, including the good news editors of good and responsible media, are looking for news stories. So somebody comes up, and I'm just making this up, Gene, with a story about how um, a roommate 
of Kamala Harris way, way back when in college or something uh, had an argument with her and she was nasty and they were both fighting, whatnot. Oh, that's great, that's great color. Um, and that's a raw meat story that has nothing to do with anything, um, but it's gonna, it's gonna satisfy the, uh, the David Brooks inquiry for the next story. It's gonna uh, satisfy the raw meat um, gossip column standard, and uh, they have to keep the eyes on the channel, the eyes on the newspaper. They're going to print that because they, they have to have eyeballs, and eyeballs mean advertisers, and advertisers mean bottom lines. That's the way it works here in these United States. So, you know, you say that people have to carefully choose their media, and I totally agree. A lot of people don't have the time, inclination, or you know, the, the background to do that, the inclination to do that. So you have to leave it, at least to some extent, in the hands of the media itself. There should be a news editor that says, I don't care uh, about a spat between roommates uh, many, many decades ago. I don't care. And we're not going to print that. It may be true. It may be interesting. It may be raw meat. But it is not relevant to the issues at hand. I say no, even though I may not, I may not have as many eyeballs as before, even though my, my investors, my stockholders, my advertisers may want me to print that, but I'm not going to do it. And so I think we have to look at the media to make those choices, to make the choices that make them responsible as I, th I believe the media were more responsible in days gone by about making those choices. Uh, the, qu the question, though, is how do you get the media to do that? Even the good media. Fox News is going to take that story in a minute, and they're going to run with it. I mean, I remember watching the Joe Manchin maneuver um, back a couple of days ago. They covered Joe Manchin's possible wishful dream of becoming, you know, a, a contender in the presidential race uh, for, you know, it's interesting. You had X minutes on, on Kamala Harris and her campaign, and then you had Joe Manchin. And Joe Manchin got X times two minutes. Why? Because it's interesting. We remember him. He's, a, he's the jerk, you know, who was so provocative before, a couple of years ago, always doing things that were provocative and nasty and, un, you know, unconstructive. Um, so that, that's my problem. The editors are going to take those stories like Joe Manchin and give them at least as much time. And who's to stop them? Who's to stop them, Gene? Well, the editors themselves uh, know what their job is. They know how to perform that job. And like everything else, there are good editors and there are bad editors. And what happens sometimes, uh, as recent spats of the Washington Post have shown, is that when you uh, have a new batch of people put in charge that are at odds with the journalists that have been there forever, um, they, they can gang up on the editor and get rid of an editor that they don't uh, think is doing their job. So you kind of have to pick your media outlets according to their past history, have they been reliable in the past? Can you depend on them? And are the majority of people connected to them doing their job properly? Because even if you get a bad apple in there once in a while, those that are doing their job will have a consensus opinion on things. Um, oh, by and large, uh, good journalists are very principled people in the sense that they are doing a job which doesn't get them millions of dollars. I'm not talking about the high-profile anchors on, on Fox News and, and uh, CNN and all of that. I'm talking about an ordinary journalist that goes to work, earns a nice living at the New York Times, but is not may have a, a household name for his readers or her readers, but is not a, a rock star. Uh, there shouldn't be rock stars in journalism because the story is what, what really counts and what you bring to that story, the questions you ask, who you ask them of, and do you get down to the bottom of things? For example, there is a huge vacuum in coverage right now as to what is going on in Gaza. 
And we know why. It's because journalists in Gaza can't get in, and the ones that get in risk being killed. That's a story in itself, isn't it? So if the journalists can't get in or they're being killed, well, you can write a story about why that is. But are we getting that story? No, they're just staying away from it. I agree with you. It's a practical thing. At the same time, you know, uh, it's easy to get to Israel. It's easy to get to the King David Hotel and sit around on the bar. This has always been the case in, in international reporting and schmooze with all the other journalists and get all the gossip. And so um, you, you find a lot of stories um, criticizing Israel because that's available. All of the detail is available. All those guys are sitting in the King David bar schmoozing with their colleagues. And that's, that's, that's always been the case. But, I, but I, I'm not, you know, we, we need to get a handle on whether those stories are at the top of the heap. You know, I find a lot of stories, for example, in the New York Times are anti-Israel, anti-Zionist. And uh, they've been doing it for a long time. They're kind of woke in that way. And I, I don't know what to do about that. I still read the New York Times, but I feel they're slanted. You talked about, um, you know, the point of view, the takeaway, and they have a takeaway. And a lot of people will tell you they have a takeaway to, you know, talk about the humanitarian issues and um, not talk about Israel's problem about survival. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know what to do about that. It's almost like what you need is another media uh, that reports on the media. You know, like, for example, the New York Times has a, an editor called the public editor. And the public editor is supposed to look at what the New York Times is doing, how the stories are going, how the public is reacting, and give a sort of third party view, a sort of a, an independent view of how they are doing. I don't know if they still have that, but I remember they had that. And sometimes the public editor would criticize uh, a, a journalist, a reporter for something or other, or the newspaper for something or other. This doesn't make friends, but it certainly helps you. And I think there ought to be some kind of organization or website uh, or media itself that will say, here are the media outlets that are honest, where the priorities are honest, where the point of view and the takeaways are identified and honest, um, and where they don't lie, don't go out of their way to lie. And there are no rock stars here. We just report the news, and, we, and when, when it's opinion, we say that. I don't know if they have an institution like that, but they should. Well, a couple of points here, Jay, and, and you bring up some interesting things here. I heard something remarkable. I was listening to the story after Joe Biden stepped down. On MSNBC, they had a panel of analysts headed up by, of course, Rachel Maddow. And I was flipping channels. I wasn't just watching MSNBC either. And um, all of a sudden, um, they started really coming down hard on the New York Times. This was after Kamala Harris really showed that she had the votes, the delegates, to become the, the new candidate. And they were saying how the New York Times had really been very irresponsible in immediately after the debate stating that Joe Biden should step down without giving it any time and really coming down hard, influencing something that was going on politically because it's a big voice to the world, not just the United States. And this was the liberal media criticizing the liberal media, which I thought was very healthy. But I hadn't seen that very often. Secondly, regarding a really awful, difficult, terrible uh, attempts uh, to cover uh, what's happening in a, in a real war in Gaza. Um, you know, the story about why that war can't be covered isn't just a point of view. The whole polarization over what is happening in Gaza has been the result of a conscious propaganda campaign by the enemies of Israel, and it has influenced the whole discussion. By the same token, on the other side of the coin, here we have a leader of that of the Israeli forces who does not concede any flaws in anything that they have done, 
and who has been the subject of mass demonstrations by his own people to get him out of office because he's corrupt. Now, you have here something where the press finds it easy to talk about when Netanyahu comes to speak to Congress, what people thought of this, protest pro, protest against, but they don't find it easy to drill down on the issues behind the war. They could do that, but they choose rather to go with the conflict that the war has created, thus increasing polarization. Yes, and, and you know, you, you talk about Israel, and that's one of two wars that's going on. Well, we do have Ukraine. And, um, we, you know, I, I do not feel that the media has kept that at the top of the priorities. You know, when it was raw meat, we had all these reporters, including cable news people, on the ground in Ukraine, in various places, dangerous places in Ukraine, telling us what was going on. Now, it's old news, Gene. It's not being covered. And what's worse is that, you know, you have Trump and his friends telling you they're going to close the thing down and surrender. They're going to give it away to Putin because they are corrupt and transactionally corrupt for a long time. And so, you know, what, what I worry about is the media has had an effect. Because if you start out with all this intense coverage and then there is very little coverage, there's a message there. The message is this is not important, that nothing much is happening. There's no atrocities, no kidnapping, um, no rapes and murders on the street. Um, those, uh, those horrible shots of buildings being destroyed, hospitals and schools being destroyed. Uh, we don't see that so much anymore. So the average person concludes that other things are more important. You know, look at what's happening with the American political news, right? It sucks all the oxygen out every day, every article, every moment, every single day. But there's nothing much about Ukraine. And Ukraine is a tragedy of monumental importance and historical relevance to our lives for decades to come. So I, I don't understand that. Uh, well, I do. I think it's a priorities thing. And somebody up there in the news chain has decided that it's old news and you don't get eyeballs and therefore you don't get advertisers and therefore you don't get bottom line profit if you cover old news. So they're not covering it. I think they are covering it. I wouldn't say they're not covering it. But what happens when you get things like an assassination attempt on a U.S. president or you get the unprecedented stepping down as a candidate by a US, another US president, um, that understandably becomes uh, front and center on the front page, as they say, above the fold. What happens with Ukraine, which is ongoing, is it goes down the fold and it goes inside the pages. But uh, for example, there is a brand new commander in chief of the Ukrainian army. And he was interviewed just today uh, in an article that I saw. And he talks about where the, the war is now, where it possibly is going, about the F-16s and other such things. So it's simmering. It's still there. But unless there is some unusual attack or there is some defeat or victory, and there have been no major victories uh, or defeats recently, it's in a stalemate, um, that's going to be just sort of burbling along. But they are covering it. I, I will say that. My point is that they're not covering it the way they were. And it's the delta factor. It's the change in coverage uh, that makes people think that it's not important and that they should not get excited when Trump says he's going to give it up. And this is the same process, don't you think, uh, that we see with climate change. Climate change is the most existential threat to humanity, to the, to the species, to every country on Earth. And the, the press will tell you there's a flood, there's a fire, what have you. Um, but they are not going to get excited about, you know, the threat. And I feel there was a time when it was all the news. It was really big, really, really important news, really raw meat news. 
Um, but the raw meat news now is is the fire and the and and the storm and um, and whatever you know comes out of climate change. So um, th that that goes at the the back end of the newspaper. And and so while we fiddle, Rome is burning. While we fiddle around in wars and political insanity, Rome is burning, and we're not doing much. So the problem is if you don't cover it then people are not inclined to do anything about it. Public opinion wanes. And so when Trump and Vance say they don't care about climate change, they deny climate change, they're not going to do anything about climate change, um, the, the people, people say, well, you know, it doesn't seem to be that important anymore. So I guess they must be right. What, you, what is your reaction to that? I think each of us can pick and choose which great issues of the day we wish the uh, news media would regard as high priority and maintain a high priority coverage. And certainly for many people, climate change is that issue. And they cover it particularly when there's a personality story, uh, like the young Swedish girl, you know, who's become uh, the, uh, the protester against climate change and has um, brought together young people in Hawaii recently, we just had a, uh, a lawsuit brought by young high school students um, regarding climate change. And I, I think it's against the electric company and they settled and the governor showed up when they settled it, even though he represented the state and they were issuing a lawsuit against the state for not prioritizing climate change. And they basically won a settlement. He showed up on their side showing that that's still the priority in Hawaii to reduce emissions, even though we probably have fewer emissions than any other state in the union, yet it, given that we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Nevertheless, regardless of what each of us thinks should be high priority coverage, the news media as professionals, as editors and publishers and journalists need to exercise um, their own good judgment through their own experience as to what needs to be covered. And I was just going to add to what I had said about the coverage on Ukraine. You know, there's a legitimate complaint that Ukraine and Gaza are not the only high-profile wars going on in the world right now. Absolutely we, right. They are not covering one of the longest, bloodiest million over million casualty wars that have been going on and simmering in the Congo for many, many years. We are not covering the horrible atrocities and, quote, genocides that are going on in Sudan and South Sudan. We are not covering the injustice and ethnic cleansing that is going on in Myanmar. So, you know, <laughs> We're not terribly well informed. We're, in, we're well informed picking and choosing our conflicts and where we will intervene and where we will not. So, you know, we're going to make mistakes too. Oh, yes. We're out of time now. We could talk so much more about this, but we'll have to leave it there, Jean. Jean Rosenfeld, independent scholar. Thank you so much, Jean. Thank you, Jay. And thanks to you, our listeners, for watching. Aloha.